It's so funny about this lapel microphone. Normally, David uses this on a Sunday morning, and uh, he always brings it to me, and so I never have to give it any thought on a Sunday morning. And so I'm about ready to walk into the pulpit Sunday morning, and I sort of reach down to turn on my mic, and it's not there. Uh, David was out of town, therefore I didn't get the mic and everything. And so, so I, in my own mind, I thought, well, I'll just get up and I'll stay at the pulpit mic and everything. Everything will be all right. Well, they always turn the pulpit mic off and wait for me to turn on my mic. And uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but those guys over there in the sound booth can send any message they want to me on that screen that's up there. And so if I'm speaking sometime and you see me smile real big, know that one of those nuts over there <laughs> sent me a message over there. <laughs> And very gently they said, your lapel mic is not on. Well, I got tickled because I think they thought I had it. And when I, when I read that, your lapel mic is not on, I thought, sure it's not on. I, you know, I don't even know where it is. And, uh, uh, but that, that's interesting. But I've got the lapel mic tonight. We have been, we've been uh, three months talking about this matter of getting serious about saving other folks. And uh, if... if I guess, I guess the question needs to be asked, what's this matter of Christianity all about? You know, I, I mean, why, why did Jesus come? And when the Bible says, you know, always abounding in the work of the Lord, what is the work of the Lord? You, you, you understand that whole concept? I mean... If we're not careful, we'll, we'll get the concept that our responsibility in the work of the Lord is, uh, is to make sure we partake of the Lord's Supper or that, that we praise Him. And I don't want to minimize any of those things. But we, we do all of that and have we, uh, have we neglected doing the main thing and really getting involved in, in what the main thing is all about. And... Uh, you know, uh, 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 obviously, you know the verses you've already quoted just a minute ago. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. You know, I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. That's what it was all about. And the whole process of the coming of Jesus had to do with the reconciling of mankind. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we stand in the place of Christ. Look at that. Look, look at 2 Corinthians. You grab one of those pew Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the, the, the end of that talks about uh, our responsibility and, 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 and where the Lord wants us to be. When he says, uh, verse 20 now then, we as ambassadors for Christ. You think about an ambassador for the president, a specially appointed envoy to go to a distant land and to represent the president. That's what an ambassador does. And so this verse says, as ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I believe, that, I believe that's what it's all about. It is that we have been saved to become the instrument to bring about the salvation of the world. And, and I think that's, that's really, really important for us to get that fixed in our head. That, that our responsibility is to, in the place of, of Christ, to do what Christ would do if he were here. If Christ lived on your street, if he lived in your house, if he had your relatives, if, you know, that world in which you live, what would Christ do? And uh, I want us, and it depends on how much time we have, but I, but I want us to spend some time praying tonight at the end, maybe singing a couple of songs that might help us because I believe coming out of our hearts and the manifestation of, the, of the, the, the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts 
as we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs will help us. And I hope that whenever we sing, send the light, that we'll really speak to one another. You know, let the lower lights be burning. Lead me to some soul today. And the, the one other thing I want us to do, well, two things I want us to do. The first one will take just a moment, and the second one will take much of our time tonight. Is to point out the fact that in being a soul winner, we need to recognize that you don't necessarily have to answer prematurely every question people ask. I believe it's one of the, one of the grave mistakes we make in trying to, to, to win the souls of others. That we need to be willing to answer every question there is. But we can answer those questions prematurely. I mean, you think about discussing with a Muslim... Buddhist, the importance of being dunked under water in order to go to heaven when he doesn't even believe in God. Now, you take that and move that over to questions that people sometimes ask us prematurely. You cannot answer that question to a Muslim and him have any ability to understand at all what you're talking about. Why? He doesn't even believe in God. And he does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God and, and to say, well, sure you've got to do that. This is what Jesus said when he doesn't even believe in Jesus. And there are oftentimes many questions that, that, we, uh, that, we, that we tend to answer prematurely. I remember being in New Zealand and a lady saying, well, what do you think about dancing? What do you think about that? That's a premature question. Until they have made a commitment of their life to Jesus, they, might, may, they may not ever be able to understand what you're saying. Because they may have grown up in a world where they're unconscious of the fact that the Bible might talk about lasciviousness. And they may not have any idea what that sin is. And they may not in their own minds have made a commitment to Jesus to, to, uh, 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 to live by what Jesus says. And so to answer that kind of question prematurely, you know, uh, a question like, do you think only members of the church of Christ are going to go to heaven? That could so easily be a premature question because what they're saying about that and what they mean by that may, be, may not at all be what you mean by that. Sometimes people ask me that question, and I, I, I will answer it, well, I believe exactly what you believe about it. I don't believe anybody's going to go to heaven that's not obeying God, do you? All of a sudden, the, the topic has been changed. And instead of creating prejudice prematurely, you remember uh, Philip find, found Nathaniel and says, We have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Premature question. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How did he answer it? He didn't answer it. Isn't that amazing? Now, the man got the answer to the question, but he didn't get the answer in the, in the form in which he had thought about it. And so I would just caution you in, in, in relate, when, you're, when you're in a discussion that you do not prematurely answer questions because prematurely answering a question will, will, will end a study. Do you, believe my, do you believe my mother is gone to hell? Well, you may have an opinion about that mother who, uh, you know, uh, never ever went to church at all. Never ever was you know, open in their devotion to Jesus Christ. And you can answer that question. But that, you can answer that prematurely until they understand about the importance of the obedience to God. And so when people ask questions, think about, think about them, think about what they're asking. And I'm not saying avoid answering the question 
I don't know how many times in study I'd say, man, that is a great question. Can we write that question down right now? And we'll talk about it in this study sometime. That's premature. Here's what I want us to do. Rick Hall, if you'll come right here. Ricky Smith, if you'll come right here. Uh, Jerry uh, Pittman, if you'll come right here. And I thought I picked somebody uh, from over here. Greg, I guess you're young enough that you can come. Pass one of these out to, 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 uh, to everybody, okay? They're all the same, yes. Okay, they're all the same. Just, just try to get these out as quickly as we can. Sometimes in our lives, I think we, we arrive at the point of thinking, I, can't, I don't have anybody that I know that I can teach. And so what I want us to do tonight is to take about 15 minutes and make a list of people and I need your cooperation. Yeah, you know, uh, nobody will see the list but you. If you want to put down initials on this instead of names, if you want to draw stick figures <laughs> to represent these people because your mate is sitting right beside you and, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, you don't want them copying off of your answers. But here's what I want you to do. I think most everyone has a copy of these now. I want you, beside the word relatives, to write down every relative that you have, within reason, obviously, that is not a member of the church. I'm not asking you to write down every relative that you might have that you think might obey the gospel. Just write down the names of every relative that you've got that's not saved. Now you can think about children, you can think about parents, you can think about uncles and aunts and cousins and nieces and nephews, in-laws. Write down the name of everybody. All right. You may think of some others in a few minutes and go back and put them up there. Write down the names of friends that you have that are not saved. As I said, you can just put abbreviations. This, this is your list, not mine. We're not turning it in by any means. Number three, write down the names of the mates of current members whose husbands and wives, husbands are wives, are lost. I think you could include in that those who are unfaithful, Christians who are unfaithful. I think in all of this list, you could talk about, as you think about relatives and friends, and that's those who've fallen away from the Lord. They're obviously prospects and of a different nature. 
but definitely prospects. Number four is write down the names of young people who are lost. And I know the word young is relative. (laughs) But young people in this church or who used to be in this church who never obeyed the gospel... those who are part of the church and have fallen away. Number five, write down the names of delinquent members. People that used to sit somewhere in this building or maybe in that building over there on 36th Street. Think of the people who used to sit around you in, in the building here. People whose kids were friends with your kids. People you uh, invited into your home, or you invited them in the, into, they invited you into their home. You visited them maybe when they were in the hospital. Number six, write down the names of workmates or schoolmates. Schoolmates really could be people you were in school with 30 years ago that still live close enough so they're part of your life. They may, may not be a major part of your life, but did you think about, yeah, I graduated from from Palm Beach High, back when there was a Palm Beach High. <laughs> and there's some folks that I went to school with that are, that, are, that are lost. Number seven, write down the name of, names of neighbors. It may be those people, the third house down, I don't even know their name yet, but they moved in two years ago, and I remember been meaning to go see them. Number eight, and you may not even be able to necessarily put a name with this, but merchants where you shop. It may be that lady or gentleman who works at Macy's. Somebody down at Home Depot that really helped you out to find something. and you, You just establish rapport with them. Not necessarily somebody whose who's name that uh, you, you would even know. It may be that person at Starbucks that you see every day. Or Dunkin' Donuts. I said I didn't want to see any of these, but uh, Cindy Nelson, on workmates that are lost, I'd like to see your list on workmates that people you work with that are lost, okay? (laughs) And Brad points at me, right? (laughs) Cindy's one of the secretaries here. Now, having done that, I want you to look at this list and think about it is not true 
that I don't have anybody I can teach. And so what I want you to do right now is to circle, I started to say three names, and then I think I'll say five, but between three and five names of the people that that you believe are the best prospects to obey the gospel. Some of these names may be people that said, don't you ever talk to me about God again. You could add a ninth one to this, and that is people that are hurting. People who are in hospital or having family problems or whatever. That's another, that's another category. I want to tell you, the quickest way to somebody's heart is to be there when they're hurting. And there's that individual who you were part of their life whenever there was a death in their family or whatever. But I'd like to ask you because it's, it, it's your list, it's not mine. But a list of the five people if you really, really got serious about this. They're the ones I'd like to convert. I'd like to stand in the place of Jesus and say to them, be you reconciled to God. Sometimes in personal work classes, we worry so much about saying it right that we scare ourselves together to death. Fearful we'll say it wrong and therefore we say nothing. When I have said it wrong, when I have scared them. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know how to talk like you and David. And That's right. And I've said it wrong. That's right. And you think I've never said it wrong? <laughs> yes. You, 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 you know, the conversation. Uh, that we're having up here is I can't say it like you and David can but see there's not a one of us that cannot in some way or another at least open a door of opportunity to that person come and see every one of us can say come and see and so in October when we have Super Sunday on October the 10th when Sam Jones will be here. What a golden opportunity to look at this list and say, I'm going to invite 10 people on this list. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I invite 10 people on this list. Personal invitation obviously is always more powerful, but even a handwritten note with an invitation is more than, more than oftentimes we do. And we never know what is happening in the life of that other individual that has changed their heart from a conversation that you had with them some time ago. And the thing that, remember on 36th Street, many of you were not there, but we used to have prayer on Wednesday night. Was it the first Wednesday night of the month? in which we ran it just up and down the, the rows and asked everybody to lead prayers. And I remember a prayer that was prayed that I will never forget, and I've used it again and again when I've talked about doing personal work. I challenge you to pray this prayer that somebody in this church taught me how to pray. Here, we, here are the words that was prayed in a one sentence prayer when we just went up and down the aisle letting any of the men that wanted to pray. And here was the prayer. God, I'm scared to death to say something to anybody. Please God, back me into a corner where I don't have any option but to say something.
That's a prayer. Please, God, back me into a corner where I don't have any option but to say something. And then you let the Lord find the corner. And he won't give you a corner big enough than the one you could stand in. And you pray it again and again and again. When my son David came in, six years of age, I guess, he'd been outside riding on a broomstick for a horse. And he parked his horse and came running into the house and say, Daddy, I, I, I want to ask you something. Could you get me a horse? I said, I don't know, where could we keep it? He said, in the basement. <laughs> and I said, well, we'll talk about it some more. He never again asked me to buy a horse. He didn't really want one. He was just tired of <laughs> riding a broomstick for a horse. But let me tell you what I think I would have done if the next day he'd come in and the next month and six months later it'd been a regular conversation between me and him about, Daddy, I want a horse. My whole response might have been different. And so if you're serious about being a soul winner, God, I'm scared to death. Please, God, back me into a corner where I don't have any choice but to say something for you. There are people that I love to hear pray, and this is not to honor them in any way, but I know from their life that whenever they lead public prayer, it comes from a heart where there's private prayer. And one of those men is here tonight. And Ron Brackett, I want to come and I want to ask you to come and pray that God will help this church do personal work. Ron's been a member of this church for 35 years. He's just taken a three-year hiatus from it. And when he has a stroke up there at Central Florida Bible Camp, we're going to bring him back down here some way. Let's bow together, please. For God in heaven, it is such a privilege that we have to be able to come before you and uh, call you our Father. We uh, are so thankful to you, Father, for the great love and compassion that you have expressed to us, for the love and grace that's been extended to us in the giving of your Son on the cross of Calvary in our behalf. Father, we too often don't think about the great blessing that we have because we are your children. Father, we pray that every day of our lives we might be ever more mindful of the way that you bless us, the way that you watch over us, the way that you seek for our good. And Father, we pray that we might take great comfort in that, find strength in that, and certainly find hope in those promises that you give us. Father, we are mindful that there are many people in this world and so many that we're aware of who uh, are in need of the gospel. And Father, we pray that in some small way we might be instruments of yours to talk to them, reach out to them, and talk to them about Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, for those people in our lives who have had influence on us to help shape us spiritually and have uh, done something to bring us to Christ and help us to grow 
as, as stronger Christians in our lives. And Father, we pray that as those people were put before us in our lives, that we might be used in some way to reach out to others as well. Father, I'm thankful for this congregation, uh, for all that it has meant to me over the years. We're thankful for so many members who are involved in the work and concerned about souls. We're thankful for a leadership that, that has a vision for spreading the gospel throughout the world, and for a congregation as a whole that comes together and not only puts the talk not only expresses the talk, but puts that talk into practice. For their willingness to sacrifice and to uh, give monies, give of their time and their talents, develop themselves so they might be better instruments of yours in the kingdom. Father, we pray that you would uh, uh, continue to be with this congregation, be with each member individually, as we pray, Father, that you would back them in corners, that you would open doors for them to... Uh, to walk through and to uh, uh, give them those the, the vision and the eyes to see souls. And Father, help each one here be more mindful of the lost that are around us and be more brave in opening our mouths, trying to overcome the fears that we have for saying the wrong thing. But Father, we pray that we might be such students of your word that when it comes time to express something about the gospel that we might have those words readily on our lips because they dwell so fully in our hearts. Father, continue to watch over us and again, give us opportunities to serve, to reach out to others. Continue to bless us each and every day of our lives. In Christ's